Hey, Friendship family. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And this week, I want us to talk about purity. Remember that throughout this letter, we've been talking about how God calls us and equips us as his people to wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus. In fact, 1 Thessalonians is what we call an eschatological epistle. That means it's a letter written about the end of days, about the second coming of the Lord Jesus, about his great return. And what Paul is doing for the Thessalonians, and by extension for you and for me, is he's teaching us how we are to wait on Jesus' return. Because after all, what we realize as believers in the Lord Jesus is that we live in this space between. Between his first coming, when he came to, to conquer our sin by his death, burial, and resurrection, and his second coming, when he will come to conquer all of his foes and vindicate all of his saints. We live in this space between a kingdom that has come and a kingdom that is coming between the already and the not yet. And because we live in this space between, we need to learn how to wait, how to live our lives in anticipation of Jesus Christ and in fulfillment of the mission that he has given us. And Paul is teaching us in this letter to the Thessalonian believers just how to do that. You remember that he started off by talking about prayer. He, he taught us that, that by his own example, prayer is a discipline that we should embrace. We should pray to God in thanksgiving and in gratitude. We should pray uh, knowledgeable and cognizant of the believers that we are in fellowship with, seeing what God is doing in their lives. We should pray with an evaluation of our own witness, seeing uh, an openness to the Spirit to, to show us how we're doing in, in our fulfillment of the command and commission of Christ in our lives. And when we pray, we should pray so that the mission of God comes into focus, so that we begin to see Jesus' call on our lives as the utmost. And then Paul took us into issues of productivity. He taught us how to evaluate our lives and see, is the gospel producing the fruit that it should in us? How do we know if the gospel has actually taken root? And so we talked about that. We talked about the fact that we know the gospel has taken root uh, when it becomes personal, when it's no longer just the word of God, but when it's, uh, it's our own testimony, it's the gospel that saved us. And we talked about the fact that we know the gospel has taken root when it becomes a priority, when we are a people intent on sharing Jesus and making disciples of him. And we talked about the fact that we know the gospel uh, has taken root in us when it begins to produce patience. When we all of a sudden are willing not just to rush past difficult moments, but to embrace them as seasons when God is going to teach us and, and mold us and shape us according to his will. And then we move from, uh, from a call to prayer and a call to evaluate productivity to an embrace of persecution. You remember that one of the things that we are called to see as Christian people is that suffering and hardship and persecution are part and parcel of the Christian experience. These are things that we should expect in our walk with the Lord Jesus. And so we talked about how can we endure suffering? How can we endure persecution? And we learned that we can do that by, by savoring our relationship with God, by setting an example of holiness, by seeing what God is doing around us, by, by stewarding well the gospel that has been entrusted to us. And then last week we talked about persistence. And the fact that we are called to, to endure, we're called to persevere, we are called to persist in the faith. Not to give up, not to give way, not to give out, but to go on in obedience to Jesus. And so we talked about how we can persist. We persist by valuing uh, gospel partnerships. We persist by, by expecting opposition and oppression. We persist by actively resisting temptation. We persist by leaning into God for growth. And today, I want us to start talking about a call to purity. 
Because Paul makes this turn in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He begins by using the word finally. And so it clearly Paul has in view the end of his letter. He's getting down to what's really important here. He's getting down to the, the matters of great weight. And what Paul is going to teach us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 1 through 8 is that as believers in the Lord Jesus, we have a call on our lives to personal holiness, a call to, to sanctification. There's a requirement of purity that God makes in our lives. And so I want us this week to talk about what purity means for us as the people of God. So let's read together 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And today we're just going to focus on verse 1. Paul says this, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do more, do so more and more. So Paul says here that, that this call to holiness, this call uh, to obedience to the Lord Jesus, this call to, to walk in holiness before God is something that is not new. It's not a new teaching. It's not an invented thing. It's not something that they came up with all of a sudden. In fact, this has been a part of their teaching from the beginning, so much so that it has already begun to be practiced by the Thessalonians. They're already walking well before the Lord Jesus. But Paul says this, you ought to do it more and more. And the reason that we're called to pursue holiness in greater amounts, the reason that we ought to never give up or be satisfied with our level of sanctification but should go on in the pursuit of purity is that it is pleasing to the Father. He says that in verse 1, doesn't he? He says, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. So Paul says here that, that this walk of holiness, this walk uh, of sanctification, this purity that we are called as Christian people to pursue is something that we ought to do, right? It's a standard that's set for us, but we do it because it is pleasing to God. It brings him pleasure. He delights in it. Purity is a delight to the Father. As I was reading this, I couldn't help but think about that classic television show, Andy Griffith. You will remember that wonderful television show. And, and one of my favorite episodes is the episode called Housekeepers. And it's where Aunt B has to leave for a little while and go take care of a family member. And so Andy and Opie are left behind. And the show begins when Aunt B is still at home and, and she's having to keep house. And, and Opie and Andy, they've made quite a mess of things. And Aunt B's worried that if she leaves home, the house is going to be destroyed. And so Andy, he sets forth from the time that Aunt B leaves that they're really going to make an effort to keep things going well. And from the beginning, he says to Opie, he says, you know, uh, we're not going to keep house and, and keep things nice and neat because uh, it's going to please Aunt B. We're going to do it because it's the right thing to do. And then a little while after they're, they're washing dishes and, and Andy says, boy, this will be uh, pleasing to Aunt B. She'll be so proud of what we've done. And Opie says, I thought we weren't doing it to please Aunt B. And Andy says, nothing wrong with killing two birds with one stone, is there? Andy realizes that, that he can please Aunt B and do the right thing at the same time. And I couldn't help but think about that as we, as we ground our thoughts about purity in the delight of the Lord. We will come to the end of this section on, on Friday and look at verses 7 through 8. And what we will see is that purity is not just a delight to the Father. Purity is a demand of God. It is something we have to do. It's something we're commanded to do. It's something that, that is required of us. But understand this. It's not just something required of us. It's not just something demanded of us. It's not just something that we have to do. Brothers and sisters, it is something we get to do for God's glory, for God's delight, for God's pleasure. Purity is a delight to the Father. That means, brothers and sisters, that the more we pursue purity, the more God is pleased with us. Now, I hope you understand your pursuit of purity is not something you can do in your own strength. And your pursuit of purity is not something that will bring you into the kingdom of God. 
In fact, what we will understand as we walk through these verses is that the sanctification that is wrought in our hearts and the discipline of purifying ourselves, particularly in terms of, of sexual holiness, these are things that we cannot accomplish in our own power. They're things that we cannot do on our own apart from faith in the Lord Jesus. And so we don't ever want to walk away from this thinking that we can purify ourselves and so bring ourselves into the presence of God. But because we have been brought into his presence by faith, because we have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, because we do know him as our own Savior and Lord, we can, by the power of his Spirit and in the obedience to his word, we can purify ourselves in order to bring pleasure and glory to our great God. And so this week, as we talk about the way that we should wait upon Jesus and talk about the fact that one of the ways that we wait on him is by pursuing purity. I want you to remember that purity brings delight to the Father. Let's pray together. Lord, our desire as your children is to honor you and to please you. Lord, we all have earthly moms and dads that that we often want to please as children. We want to we want to have a proud parent and and God, even in the best of those circumstances, we're finite and fallen creatures and we're unable to do that perfectly. But even more so, God, we desire to please you as our Heavenly Father. We're thankful that, that our relationship with you is not grounded on the fact that we please you because the reality is on our own, apart from the work of your Son, we could never please you. But because Jesus has satisfied the penalty for our sin, because we're righteous, declared holy in him, because we have a relationship with you through your son Jesus, we long to please you. And so God, I pray that for me as, as an individual and for all of us as believers in Jesus and for our church as a whole, that God, we will pursue purity knowing that it delights you, that, that it brings pleasure to you, that you take great joy in the fact that your children long to be holy. And Lord, I pray that as we begin to do the hard work of putting to death those sins that, that creep in and destroy our purity. Help us to realize in the pain of that that you take great pleasure in it. And that should be our greatest desire, not to please ourselves, but to please you. We pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.